You know, I've preached uh, on fear all over the world. Uh, it's the one thing that God uh, put in me, getting free, because He did it in me. Amen. And uh, I preached it all over the world in many ways and shapes and messages. And, you know, when, when God said, preach on fear, I'm like, well, Lord, you know. And He said, do the whole thing. Do all of it. Amen. And so... Uh, we're just pressing in and digging in to all the things that we need to know to make sure that you get free of all fear. Amen? Hallelujah. So we talked last week about uh, God being real serious about that, about God saying, do not fear in some way, in some form, in some fashion, through various phrases. He said that 365 times in the Bible. Do you know that? That God said it. He thought it was so important that He just kept... It's like every day He got up, He just said it again. Just do not fear. And I know that when God says something just once, it's important. I mean, after all, He is God, right? And what does He know? He knows everything. Amen? And He loves us and wants what's best for us. So when God says that He wants us to eliminate the fear, He's serious about it. Amen? When He keeps on saying it and keeps on saying it and keeps on saying it, He's really serious about it. It. And so I know that because God has said it, first of all, that God, if God said it, that God will equip me. He'll give me the tools. He'll give me the authority. He'll give me the power to do what it is that He said do. Amen? Amen. How, you, how many of you know that God is just, right? God would never tell you to do something that you're not able to do. Amen? So on the inside of us, we have the ability to live totally full of faith in life and totally fearless throughout all of our life. We have that ability. And so I just want to cut right to the chase here today. I want to look each one of you in the eye and tell you that there's absolutely no reason in any way, shape, or form that it is okay for you to live with fear. It's kind of like when you're a parent and you know something. Come on, parents. How many of you know something? You've been there, done that. God's been there. Amen? He knows something. It's like a parent saying something to their kid. And you tell your kid and they don't listen. And you tell your kid and they make an excuse. And you tell your kid and they think, well, that doesn't apply to me. And you tell your kid and they're thinking, well, that's not my situation. And you tell your kid and they think, it's almost like, come on, parents. It's like you think that they think that they know better than you. Right. Well, I want to tell you today that you don't know better than God. Right. And so today you're going to have to let your fear be exposed and realize that there's no rock to crawl under here. There's no reason, there's no excuse, there's no, there's no situation in life that ever warrants a Christian who has the blood of Jesus, who has the name of Jesus, who has the Word of God, who has the Holy Spirit. There's absolutely no reason at all ever that we should fear. Amen? And so we're going to get rid of fear. I mean, we, we started last week and we're going to go through this and I want you to know that because God has given me a mandate to do this, that as I preach, what I do know is that God is going to confirm the word that I preach. Amen? And I know that as I preach, the anointing is going to come, faith is going to come, and I'm telling you right where you're sitting today, you're going to get free of fear. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. We learned last week that fear is actually an enemy to our faith. And we know that we're supposed to live by faith, right? Yeah. It actually says in Hebrews 11:33 that it's through faith that we subdue kingdoms. Yeah. We're living in the kingdom of God. Yeah. We're opposing the kingdom of darkness. It's through faith that we subdue kingdoms. Yeah. It's through faith that we work righteousness. Righteousness being right with God, causing the right thing to happen in the earth by our faith, by our authority, by our power. It is through faith that we obtain promises. Yeah. God has given some great and awesome promises in His Word. And He wants us to obtain them. He actually wants us to have them. Yes. Not just read about them. Woo. Not just hear stories of other people. God wants us to obtain His promises and we do it by faith. Hallelujah. We learned last week that because faith and fear are opposites, that they can't coexist. They never coexist. You've either got faith or you're in fear. It's just that simple. Come on. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is calling it like it is. You're either in faith or you're either in fear and you've got to acknowledge that. And when you're in the faith realm, you're in God's realm. And when you're in the fear realm, you're in the devil's realm. 
Fear is the devil's realm. Now, faith is what? It's simply believing God. It's simply trusting God. It's simply believing God enough to act upon what you believe. And that's the key. Because we're not talking about dead faith. We're talking about true living faith, which says that we believe and therefore we act. Amen? And you're going to see today as we go through some of these scriptures, these people had to believe and act upon what they believed. Now, the opposite of faith is fear, and that would be basically this. It would mean uh, to be alarmed, to be dismayed, to be frightened, to be scared, to be filled with terror or dread. It means to be intimidated. Did you know that being intimidated is a form of fear? Did you know that you're not supposed to be scared of people? Did you know that you're not supposed to stand up and do whatever it is that you're supposed to do, talk in front of someone? For, you're not supposed to have intimidation. That's a form of fear, and today you need to acknowledge it. If you've got fear, if you're, you know, there's one thing about being shy, but there's another thing about being shy and way pulled back because you're intimidated about people. You can't have that. That's fear. It'll rob you. Yeah. So a form of fear is being intimidated, being anxious, doubting, and listen to this, worry. Worry is a form of fear. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, worry is fear. You cannot worry and have faith. You can't worry and have faith. Worry is fear, and fear and faith are opposites, and they never coexist. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So years ago, God told me, he said that you need to attack fear. Attack fear with the people. Attack fear. He said because it's like we've taken on fear and we're living with it, just thinking it's normal. And he said, God said this, that fear is eating people alive. That means fear is bringing destruction. To eat someone alive means to destruct. Amen? And so God said that I needed to reinforce with you the truth. And so I want you to know that the truth of God's Word, having faith in the truth of God's Word and acting upon the truth of God's Word is what's going to bring you the victory and deliver you from fear. I want you to know that you can have faith in God's Word. You can believe the truth and do the truth and see the results of this Word of God in your life. And what is the truth? Well, really the truth is this, that God is with us. Everywhere we go, in every situation, God is with us. That God is for us. He's never against us. He's always on our side. He's always on our corner. Hallelujah. The truth is, is that the Bible says that we're kept by the power of God. We're kept. I'm protected. I'm kept by the power of God. The truth is, is that the Bible says that He has given us power and authority over all the power of the enemy and that nothing, listen, nothing, that nothing, by any means nothing gets to harm us. Nothing gets to harm us in any way. That's the truth. Oh, yeah, and by the way, the truth also says that God always gives us the victory, that God always causes us in Christ Jesus to triumph. Hallelujah. That's the truth. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If we'll just enforce that, there's no reason to fear. Glory to God. Just have faith in God. There's no reason to fear. Yeah. Faith connects us to God. It's God's playing field. It's the realm in which God operates. God does things for you through faith. On the opposite hand, fear is in the devil's field. That's where the devil hangs out. That's where the devil plays. And the devil does things to you through fear. Fear connects you to the devil. And the Bible actually says in Ephesians 4.27 that we're not to give place to the devil. Again, a word from God. Don't slap God in the face by not hearing His word. God said that we're not to give place to the devil. So that means if fear is the opening of the door to the devil, which it is, then if we're having fear in any shape, worry, doubt, concern, anxiety, intimidation, feeling a little alarmed, a little scared, a little frightened. And you know, it doesn't have to be overwhelming like shaking you out of your boots fear. This is where you can't let the devil deceive you. You know, fear can be very subtle. Comes in many shapes and in many forms. But fear opens the door to the devil. So we've got to eliminate it. We've got to get it out. Turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs 29. We're not to give any place to him. 
Fear is the, door th the doorway through which Satan gains access to your life. And that's why God said that fear was eating people alive. Fear was the thing that was opening the door for the devil to come in. And usually the first place that the devil starts with fear is he'll do the very thing that you're fearful of. Because you're fearful of it, the very thing that you flung the door open with, with fear, he'll come in and do that. We saw last week that's what happened to Job. Remember that? Yeah. Well, Proverbs 29, 25 says this. It says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Another translation says a secure. So fa as faith keeps the door closed to the enemy and keeps us in the God realm where all the blessing and love and life and power and joy and peace are. But fear brings a snare. Fear brings a snare. And then if you look over, and you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read this part to you. But in 2 Timothy 2.26, it says this, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been ca taken captive by him to do his will. So fear brings a snare. It puts us in the realm of the devil. It puts us in his hand and allows him to take us captive for his will. Are you kidding me? We're Christians. Right. We're supposed to be doing the will of God. Yeah. Not letting Satan have any way, his plans, his no. schemes in our life. You know, when you think of a snare, I always think of a, of a spider. Have you ever seen a spider? They weave that web. Well, in this case, the devil is the spider and the web that he weaves is fear. And if you see his whole goal, you know, he, he can't get something outside of the web. His goal is to get them in the web. I mean, and sometimes, you know, he, oh, it's so pretty when you look at it from a distance. It just looks like it might be, oh, I just might want to touch that or I might want to get it. And I'm talking about the little, the little bugs, the little things that are going all around it. You know, they're looking out. It looks pretty. But it's a snare. And that's how fear is. It's a snare to us. If you allow yourself to get in that web of fear, then the devil is going to have access to you. And we don't want that at all. You know, I have seen fear open the door. Uh, when I was in Peru, I ministered to a young girl, and I don't know, she was probably somewhere between the age of 16 and maybe 22. Young girl, and she came up to me in the healing line, or in the line, and I think I had preached on fear that day, if I'm not mistaken. And she came up in the line and was, you know, uh, kind of distraught, as, as best I could put it. And I had lots of people. I mean, I think there were 800 people in the church that day. And, you know, there was a lot of people at the altar, and uh, so I, I, I put my hands upon her and commanded something in the name of Jesus and went on, went on, you know, went on. And all of a sudden, you know, here she is at me again and she's clinging on to me and cl clatching on to me and telling me to pray for her and me to help her. And all of a sudden, you know, I turned around and I just had a discerning of spirits right there in the middle of the altar time. I just looked at her and when I looked at her, I saw, I saw the devil on her. I saw a demon on her and it was all based in fear. And she began to tell me the story. Her mother was involved in witchcraft. I mean, heavily in witchcraft. And her mother had been putting spells on her and all this stuff. And so she was, she was dealing with all that. But the whole thing was rooted in fear. Fear had taken her captive. Fear that her mother could put a curse on her. Fear that something, you know, nothing necessarily other than her bodily thing had happened to her yet. But she did have pain all throughout her body. Her entire, here she is, a young girl, and she physically just pain. Her entire body aches. She can't sleep at night. She has tormenting nightmares. All these things going on to her. And God just simply showed me that it was all rooted in fear. And so I just put my hand on her, and I commanded the spirit of fear to depart from her. And I knew it did. But then she kept on with me. She kept on with me. And I could sense that, you know, I'd pray for fear, get it out. And then she was still scared. She's still scared because she didn't have enough of the Word of God rooted in her. And so I, this is how, it, just as best as I can describe it. I remember getting up face to face with her. And it's like it was her, but I knew it was the devil. It was the fear. And it was me and fear face to face. And I was not losing. I want you to know that greater is he. And that's what I told her. I looked at her and I said, greater is he that's in me than any fear that's in you. And you will not fear. And I tell you what, she shut up 
and went to her seat. And the next day she came back to testify. Hallelujah. She had gone home late at night, laid down, started to have a nightmare, woke up, sat up straight in bed, and oil pulled from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. And she said, as that oil came upon me, the Spirit of God came upon me, and it drove every ounce of fear and every ounce of pain. She got up completely pain-free, completely healed, completely delivered, completely happy. Her entire countenance was free. Hallelujah. Her entire countenance was joyful. Her entire countenance was just totally changed and revolutionized simply because she got rid of fear. Yeah. Glory to God. See, I never, I never dealt with the pain in her body because the pain in her body was a result of the fear in her life. And so we're going to talk about that, whether it's next week or the following week, depends on how long it takes me. We're, we are going to talk about the whys and the hows of this and get into it so that you know, not only so that you can get free, but so that you can help others get free. But I want you to know that fear will, will cost you something. Fear will rob you. It'll rob you of your blessing. It'll rob you of your miracle. It'll rob you of your promise of God. Everybody turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17, verse 8 through 16. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, this is Elijah, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he arose and went to Zarephath. And we could just stop right here and say, Well, the word of the Lord has come. The word of the Lord has come. Elijah, the word of the Lord has come. So just that's all you got to do is just do what God says. We know that's the first part. But watch what happens here. <clears throat> It says in 10 that he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was sitting there gathering sticks. And he called to her and he said, Please, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little bit of oil in a jar, jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. But I thought God said that he was going to take care of Elijah. And look what Elijah had to deal with. Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make me some for yourself and your son. And for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the oil of joy run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days, and the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according According to the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Elijah. So here we see God gave the word to Elijah. Elijah believed it. Elijah acted on it. And Elijah got to it. And then when Elijah gave the word of the Lord, he gave it the first time. He said, go make me a little bread. Bring me a little bread. But she, all of a sudden, Elijah knew that he had something to deal with. He saw it in her. He said, her hesitation, her, her, her voice, her words back. I don't have that. I can't do that. You know, I barely got enough. I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I barely, I barely got enough for my own and I'm just going to use what I got and then I'm going to go die. Oh, poor, poor, pitiful me. And Elijah knew right then and there he had to address fear. If God wanted the blessing that God had spoken to him, if, if, if Elijah wanted the provision that God had promised him, if Elijah expected to obtain the miracle that God said he could have, he understood that he had to deal with her fear. And so he turned to her instantly and he said, do not fear. And she had a choice right there. She had a choice. She's standing in limbo. Okay, do I, do I believe the word of the prophet and act upon the word of God? Or do I let this fear stay with me and go ahead and not do what God said do? But instead, she chose glory to God. She chose faith and the miracle came. Yeah. The miracle came. Elijah's miracle came and her miracle came. Yeah. 
Faith brings the blessing. Faith brings the provision. Faith brings the miracle. Faith has you obtain the promises. And fear will stand in the way and rob you and steal every time. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21. This is the story of Jesus and Jairus. Proving to you here that you've got a choice in life. Talked about that last week. That God doesn't choose for you. The devil doesn't choose for you. You choose yourself. Whether you're going to stand in faith or whether you're going to stand in fear. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So here Jesus is. Jesus has got the request. The Father is coming. He needs a miracle for his daughter who's lying at the point of death. And all the multitudes are following Jesus and thronging Jesus as Jesus is trying to make his way to Jairus' house. And we know that in the next few verses, the woman with the issue of blood comes up. I'm sure that the Father, it's not written this way, but I'm sure that the Father had opportunity at that point as he's standing there, you know, wanting Jesus to hurry along and hurry along and get to his house house, all these people coming up and all these other requests being made. You see, but Jesus wasn't pressured. Jesus knew the will of God. Jesus knew the power of God and he stayed steady and the Father remained with him. And we pick back up in verse 35 and it says, while he was still speaking, being Jesus, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. He said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Amen. Jesus instantly addressed the one thing that could prevent the miracle, the one thing that could prevent his daughter being raised. Instantly, he said, as soon as he heard the word, he turned around and he said, Don't be afraid, Amen. only believe. Yeah. Hey, we're talking about Jesus here. We're talking about Jesus had to acknowledge that this was either going to be a faith factor or a fear factor right here. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Son of God. He didn't just ignore it. He just didn't say, oh, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the Father believes. It doesn't matter. I'm Jesus. I know God. I can do it all. Do you realize that? That Jesus couldn't over... He realized that he was not able to override... The fear of the father who had authority in the daughter's life. And that was important authority at this point because the girl was dead. I mean, the girl certainly couldn't believe herself at this point. Jesus instantly had to deal with faith or fear. Instantly turned around and he said the one thing. He said, don't fear, don't fear, don't be afraid. So that Jairus could believe, stay in faith. He had already had faith, right? He'd come to Jesus. He'd come to Jesus. He, he thought, I bet Jesus can help me. And because I believe Jesus can help me, I'm going to take some steps and I'm going to get to where Jesus is. Right. Then the bad news came. Then the bad circumstance. Then the thing that he might want to look at. And Jesus said, no, no, don't fear. Only have faith. Yeah. Do you notice there also that Jesus himself didn't choose to override it? He didn't ignore it. But he also didn't override it. Just like sometimes your preacher and your pastor can't override your faith. I mean, your faithlessness. Sometimes I can't override your fear. I want to. But there's a principle here. We're talking about Jesus had to address it with the people. That's why I'm here today in Jesus' stead addressing your fears. I'm here for you today in the stead of Jesus saying, don't be afraid, only believe. And you'll get your miracle. You'll get your blessing. You'll get your provision. You'll get your promise. Yeah. And you notice here also that Jesus didn't just cast it out. Right. Come on. Uh -huh. Come on. We'll talk about that later. There, there's a difference in fears being soul-based 
which have to be driven out by the Word of God and be fear ba uh, spirit based, which can be cast out by the authority and the power that's in the name of Jesus. And Jesus knew the difference here, thank God. He didn't lay hands on her and cast uh, on him and lay hands and cast the spirit of fear out. Instead, he said, only believe. He gave the word, only believe. Gave the word, only believe. Gave the word, only believe. Only believe, only believe. He knew. But listen, what happens when the word of God comes at you? It's alive and power and sharper than a two-edged sword. And if you'll take it, if you'll take that word, just like it says in Acts, when they, they heard the word... And what? They mixed their faith with it. They let it get in their heart. They believed it, and it profited them. Amen. He said, J.I.R. said, I'm taking that word. I'm staying with it. I'm taking it. And look what happens here in verse 37. And he permitted no one to follow them except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. I love that about Jesus. He just would never admit defeat. He just would never admit. I mean, he'd stare something right in the face and just say the truth over it. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child, Jairus, who was still standing in faith, and those who were with him, and he entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. Hallelujah. Faith got the victory. Faith got the victory. Faith got the miracle. Faith got the raising from the dead. Hallelujah. Did you know that faith can raise things from the dead, even that aren't bodily? Did you know that your dreams and your desires can be raised up? The things that you've laid aside, the things that you've put aside can be raised up by faith. That you can obtain them. That you can walk in them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Faith got the victory. Hallelujah. We see that Jairus got in faith and stayed in faith. You know, I'm sure that when he went to the house, here he is, he's bringing Jesus on the scene. This is a new preacher in town. I'm bringing the new preacher into the house. And the preacher's like, get out, of, everybody get out of the room. You know, right there again, Jairus had opportunity to get into fear. He could have been intimidated. He could have felt pressured. Come on, people. He could have felt pressured by his relatives because he wasn't doing what they thought he should do. Come on. Yeah. People putting pressure on you that you ought to believe something or you should do something or you do this or you do that. That's not of God. Don't let people pressure you into worry or doubt or fear. Yeah. You stay with God. You stay on God's side. You stay with the Word of God and the truth of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he remained and he stood without fear and the miracle came. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. As Christians, we're to be faithful. Glory to God. Full of faith. Yeah. And totally fearless. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. To get the miracle, to see the promises, you're going to have to be in faith and you're going to have to stay in faith. It's by faith in what that we obtain the promises? It's by faith in patience. patience the power twins. Yeah. Faith and patience. Nobody likes the patient part. Of course, my husband always says this. He says, if you'll, if you'll believe like you're going to believe until the end, then the end will come a lot quicker. Amen? You, your patience can be cut shorter, I would say, by your absolute belief and trust, being fully convinced in God. But you are going to have to hang on until the end. I mean, you're going to have to stay with it through all the circumstances, through all the stuff that says otherwise. You're going to have to hang on to what God has said and believe it. And this is the account in Matthew chapter 14 with Peter, verse 25. It says, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. You know, we kind of laugh, but bless their hearts, they weren't saved yet. Bless their hearts, they didn't have the Holy Ghost. 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. So again, the first thing he's addressing is their fear. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, 
Command me to come to you on the water. And he, so he said to him, come. So that was the word. Jesus gave the word, come. That was the word of God. Just like this promise can be a word to you. You might get a word from God. God might speak something to your spirit. God might speak something to you through a prophecy, whatever it may be. But that was the word of the Lord that came to Peter through Jesus. And when Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Hallelujah. Peter heard the word. Peter believed the word. Peter believed it and acted upon it. Hallelujah. So faith, faith in that word brought the miracle. Hallelujah. But look what happens. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Here he is. He's walking on water. What he's walking on really is the word of God. And he begins to look around and wonder, oh, what could happen? Oh, look how, look how wind, the wind's blowing. Oh, look at the waves. Got to keep our eyes upon Jesus. We got to keep our eyes upon that Word of God. It says he was afraid and beginning to sink. He was afraid. What was he afraid of? He was afraid he was going to go under the water. He looked all around. Here he was walking on water. He looked all around. What was he afraid of? That he was going to go under the water. Fear comes right in. So what happened? He begins to go under the water. Jesus, of course, and then he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus, of course, stretches out his hand and says to him this, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, I'm pretty convinced that if Jesus was here today, in the flesh, walking, that, that many people would be offended at him. Because, you know, the church, we all just want to be pacified and pat on the back. And, I mean, he just called him out right in front of everyone. You know, couldn't you have at least called me in the office? Said that, couldn't you have said that to me? Couldn't you have said that to me on the shore later when we were alone? No. He said, oh, you, because he's teaching everybody something. All right. He said, oh, you of little faith. And I'm just going to have to stop there again, but I want you to know that Jesus was perfect. You do remember that, right? He never sinned. And what is the royal law of, of love? It's the royal law of love that we live by, right? The thing is that we're to love God and we're to love other people as ourselves. And because Jesus never sinned, we know that he always operated perfectly in love. So this was a loving statement. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That is a loving statement. Do you know that correction can be loving? <laughs> so we see this, that Jesus addressed this. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now what I want to point out to you here is that word little faith does not mean that he had a little bit of faith and a lot of doubt. Okay? We know that faith and fear or doubt can't coexist. Jesus already said he got scared, he doubted. So we know that at that point he didn't have faith, he had fear. What that word little means there, it means of short term or short endurance. It means of short duration. What Jesus was telling him was that you had faith for just a little bit of short period of time. And in that period of time, you got the miracle. You were walking on water. The miracle came. The blessing came. The provision came. The promise came. Oh, but then something happened. And, oh, you couldn't hang on. And I want you to know that when Peter, who was walking on water with the master Jesus himself, began to creep, let, let doubt and fear and worry begin to creep in. He lost the miracle. He lost his faith. The fear right there lost his faith. It caused him to lose the miracle. You know, there's been times I've prayed for people and I've, I've known what's happened in the spirit. I've known that either, either the devil went out of them I mean, I felt the spirit depart. Yeah. Or I've known that healing came to then. I, I, I know the power of God. Listen, when the power of God is administered to your body yeah. and you receive it, something happens in your body. Whether it happens that instant, whether it happens an hour later or a day later or a week later, depends on what you do with your faith. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on whether you think, Oh, what didn't happen within an hour must not have worked. Well, I guarantee you then you lost it. Yeah. Brother Hagen used to say that when he would administer the healing power to people and he would sense it go out of them and he would sense them receive it because that is your part. You have to receive it. 
that he would tell them, your confession is the healing power of God has been administered to my body and it is affecting a cure. It is affecting a healing. And if you will believe that and say that and believe that and say that and believe that and say that, eventually your body will respond and line up with that. So this is not about having just faith at the moment when you come up here and I pray for you and I lay hands on you. This is about you remaining in faith. Yes. All right. Against all obstacles. You know, when Peter was walking on the water at that moment, that was pretty much the biggest thing that could happen would be he sink. I mean, at that moment, that was the biggest thing, that he would sink and go under. So it doesn't matter what your circumstances are saying. Your circumstances are subject to your faith. Hallelujah. 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 Isn't that good news? Yeah. So what Peter should have done was the minute he recognized that that was beginning to creep in, that fear, that doubt, he should, he should have dealt with it. That's what you've got to do. You can't let any fear in any way, shape, or form begin to creep into your life about anything. I mean, it's not okay to have any kind of fears about anything. I don't know why, but I just sense today... You know, like, like God is saying, don't slap me in the face by telling me that it's okay for you to be scared of whatever you're scared of. And I know that all these people in the room, we're all in a different place. We all have temptations. We all have issues, things that come at us. But none of it is okay because it will rob you. It will steal from you. Fear always costs you something. And fear starts out, it's seemingly so small, almost insignificant. Just a little doubt comes. You know, I've only heard the audible voice, audible, voice of God once. And, I, you know, I'm all about telling on myself. I, this is many years ago, and I had believe, been believing God for a something. And I mean, I mean God was in it. You know, I wasn't just choosing to believe God. You have to know God's in it. You have to be believing what God says you can have, the promise. You have to stand on the Word. Jesus had to give the Word to come for Peter. To, Peter couldn't just jump out of the boat. I mean, he had to have the Word of God to stand on. And I was trusting God for a, a big something in my life, a situation that I was involved in. And God had spoken to me on many times, many occasions, because He's so merciful and so gracious that sometimes, you know, He, he tells us and then we need to hear it again and we're like, back again, tell me again, Lord. And He'll like, tell us again. And then we're like, three days later, tell me again, Lord. And He'll tell me, you know, He is graceful. I mean, gracious to us and merciful to us. And so I had been in one of those places the night before where I was, you know, kind of crying out to the Lord, Lord, you know, about this situation. And the Lord, I mean, it was like God just sat down in my room, crossed his legs with me, and we had a chat. And I came up out of there, you know, the word of the Lord. It wasn't that I had not heard it before, but you know how it is when you get in the presence of God and it's real and you know that it's, and then nothing's going to get in your way. So the next day I was driving to work. And I was driving along, and the little bitty thought, and that's how I describe it. It wasn't all of a sudden like I thought God's not going to do it. It was just a little bitty thought. The thought was like, what if? And I'm telling you all what, I heard the audible voice of God so much to the point that I pulled my car over on the side of the road because I thought my windows were going to bust. And God said, didn't I say? I mean, he shouted. At the top of his lungs, as loud as it could get, didn't, because God knew that I was fixing to let this little bitty thought of a doubt creep. And he was reminding me, didn't I just say? And he repeated what he had said in a very short and to the point matter. The only time I've heard the audible voice of God. But I recognize, you know, fear wants to come in very subtly. Seemingly so small and so insignificant and just make you, make you want to doubt. But I want you to know that fear is never content to remain where it's at. If fear is aggressive, it's going to bully, it's going to push its way, it's going to forcefully work to take more ground. Always that's what fear does. It's never stagnant, it never stays the same. Small fears grow into big fears. 
You know, when, when someone begins to, to develop, and you know today, there's, I know there's all kind of medical terms on it, but I'm just going to go with what God's got me, got me on. There's all kind of medical terms for the ADD stuff and the uh, ob obsessive compulsive disorders and obsessive compulsive, you know, all this stuff. But I want you to know that those things, they're devil-based. They're based in fear. They're based in fear. They're always based in fear. In the very beginning, somehow, fear began to get in. And because we, you know, just a little bitty tendency to think, well, I better make sure my door's locked. Oh, I better go back and make sure my door. Oh, I better check three or four or five. That is fear. And if you don't get a grip on it, what will happen is you will eventually become obsessive, compulsive disorder because that fear is going to get on you. Those devils are going to come in and they're going to take over. And then you end up having stuff like the hoarders. That is de that's demonic. It's based in the devil. I'm just calling it like it is. And you can medicate it. You can ignore it. You can pacify it. You can do whatever. But it ain't changing until you get the power of God on it. So what I want you to know is that fear can get in and mess up your mind. Fear can get in all these mental things that people have where people have delusions and people are all psychotic and people are all schizophrenic. Those are all things that are based in the mind. They are demonic. They're not just medical. When you see people like that in the Bible, the, the man at the Gadarenes and people like that who were out of their mind, they never said it was a medical condition. They said that they had devils. And they knew how to address it. Until we stand up and say what it is and know how to address it, we're never going to get rid of it. I mean, we got we to gotta get this mind. It's, it's a, your mind is important. You're supposed to have the mind of Christ. But even, even aside from that, let's just have a stable mind. Can we all in the church just have a sound mind? That's what I'm rooting for. Let's just everybody have a sound mind. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Listen to this. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear, cowardliness, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So that means if we don't get fear, we get a sound mind. See how they're connected? That means if we get fear in there, and we're opening ourselves up to having an unsound mind. I want you to know that undisciplined thought patterns, undisciplined things, things that you just let roll around in your head that are not of God. That, and I'm not talking about wild, crazy, bad things. Come on, most of us are Christians. We're not thinking upon the bad things. I'm just talking about things that are contrary to the Word of God. I'm talking about things that are contrary to the promise that God has made you. Those are undisciplined thoughts. And if you let those undisciplined thoughts roll around in your head, you'll get an unsound mind. The Bible says that we have to, ta we have to take authority over our thoughts. We have to take authority. This is authority of taking authority over fear, not letting it creep in subtly. You know, it just first it's just a little bitty thought. Before you know it, I mean, it just is, you know, it's, it's more and it's more. And before you know it, it's harassing your mind and people lay down and they can't sleep at night. This is how fear gets in. We got to get rid of it, folks. I mean, it is never okay. It is never okay for a Christian to have fear. The Bible says that we, again, this is our choice. God can't make the choice. The devil doesn't get to make the choice. You make the choice of fear or faith. And the Bible says that we're to take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. We're to take our thoughts captive to this Word of God. Is what you're thinking lining up with this? Is what you're thinking lining up with what God has spoken to you? If it's not, you need to take it captive to the obedience of Christ so that you don't get into the snare of the devil and be found doing His will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We can't let the devil get in through fear. But I, I just want to remind y'all again, I mean, that the Word of God is just so, that the Word of God and the power of God is just so much greater. Yeah. I mean, I have seen people delivered like this. You know, that girl, when she walked off, I knew that the devil had gone out of her, but I don't know that she really knew. But I wasn't moved by what I saw or what I didn't see in the natural. You know, at the time, I didn't even ask her if her pain had left. And obviously, it hadn't yet. 
But I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that God and me was greater than that devil and standing yeah. in front of me, and I was winning. Uh -huh. When I say I, I mean God in me was winning. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I stood on that. I mean, I thoroughly expected that she was free. Yeah. And I have seen people, I mean, one time I prayed for a girl, she came up, and I remember she I had so she dealt with severe fear is how she described it and she was on anxiety medication and she took medication every day okay this wasn't just a feel like a something's coming on she took medication every day and even on her medication she still had severe anxiety attacks I'm talking about attacks where they would have to do stuff with her at work and try to get her just crazy stuff I mean, attacks where she almost felt like she was dying and just weird, cry, overcome her even on her medication. Yeah. Uh -huh. You can't medicate a devil. <laughs> you know, the, the truth is the devil likes to get people on medication so that he can subdue them, yeah. Yeah. suck the life out of them, kind of num numb them, yeah. take them into nothing like this. That's what medication like that does. Anyway, she came up and... And, you know, told me the story. And I just, I mean, I just simply put my hands on her and whatever with God. And she was totally delivered. You know, I went back five months later. And from that very day, that very Sunday, she never, ever, ever again took a medication. And she did not have one panic attack, not one anxiety attack ever came upon. Just simply like that in the moment. I mean, what happened is as I was preaching, she heard the word of the Lord and she believed it. And I think she purposed in her heart that when she came forward and I prayed for her, that together it was going to happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many people I've seen like that. I had a lady one time I prayed for, her, and she was probably in her mid-40s. And she told me that she had dealt with severe fear her entire life. I mean, as long as she could remember, she had fears of all sorts of stuff, stuff that disrupted her life. Again, prayed for her, and she was totally set free. Same church that was that day. Five months later again, I'm back. She's totally free. Yeah, Praise God. God can deliver you. God wants to deliver you. God will deliver you. God is able to deliver you. Fear is dangerous. It has a serious cost, as we've seen. It robs you of your faith. It robs you of your blessings, your miracles. It can rob you of your mind. Do you know that fear manifests, shows up, reveals itself in your mind and in your body? Turn with me. I'm going to prove it to y'all. You're looking at me like, huh, I ain't so sure. Luke 21, let me show you this. Luke 21, verse 25 and 26, and Jesus said this. So there you go. Ha, Jesus said it. And there will be signs in the sun and signs in the moon and signs in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Listen to this. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. What happened here? People died of heart attacks. Why? Because of fear. People died of heart attacks because of fear. Not just because they had a heart problem. Not because, come on. See, uh, what, what we've been trained to do by the world is look at the outer thing and put a medical reason to it. But I want to know, I want you to know many of the medical reasons are based in fear. Yeah. Many of the reasons you have heart problems is because you're stressed out about life. It shows up in your body. The truth is we were created in the image of God and we were not meant to carry worry, fear, dread, terror, anxiety, intimidation, stress, fear, doubt. We were not made to carry. Our bodies were not made with the capacity to carry that. Do you know that the, the root word of stress means to choke and to strangle? That is what the root word of it means. That is really what's happening. You know, I, I thank God for the medical field. You know, for those who don't know the Lord and don't whatever, I mean, I'm thankful for the medical field. I do believe that God can get involved in that sometimes. And, you know, praise God. But we can't put everything over in the medical realm. The truth is, usually, for everything, there's a spiritual connection. So many times when we've got stuff going on, 
It's because there's something spiritual happening on the inside. We've got fear about that, worry about that, stress about that. You know, Jesus made a very great statement in Matthew chapter 6, 25, when he just said, just don't worry about your life. It's just a short phrase, isn't it? Don't worry about your life. Well, well, what's in your life? Everything. Everything is in your life. I mean, Jesus just said, don't worry about it. He didn't say, don't worry about it if everything seems to be okay. Uh, don't worry about it when things are looking good. Uh, don't worry about it when you're in church and hanging on for a day or two. He just said, don't worry, man. I mean, just like, don't worry. <laughs> How about us? We, we just believe that and act upon that. Yeah. Do, do you know that I believe because Jesus said that, that if we'll take that to heart and make a decision on that, Jesus will help us not, not worry. Yeah. And you'll find that your life will get revolutionized and your, and your mind will be clearer. You know, I, I remember when we were in New Zealand, I had a guy that came up. I actually had a word of knowledge that the Lord wanted to uh, deliver someone that had an unclear mind. And I remember this guy came up, and I remember when he stood in front of me. I mean, he just was mentally off, and I knew it was devil-based. And I commanded the devil to get out of him. And, you know, when I say devil, I mean the demons. I don't mean the devil he himself is, but, you know, the evil spirits. And uh, he, he went out in the spirit, and, and as I, 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 I knew that the, it had departed, but yet I knew there was something. Y'all yeah. remember I told y'all about this, and I knelt down. And began to tap by the Spirit of the Lord, begin to tap his feet and, and, com and command the fear to go. And command the fear to go. See, his mind, you know, was opening and thing, but the fear, it was the fear. It was the fear that had allowed it all in to start with. It was the fear that had brought it all on. And I recognized right there by the Spirit of the Lord, if we didn't get the fear gone, you know, it didn't matter about what I had done, what God had wanted to do with him right that moment. And I, I, knew, I knew when it let go, his, his body, just like our fear, our body manifests fear, many times when fear departs, it, his, when, I, when I did it that last time and I felt the spirit go out, his whole body relaxed. And I just felt the peace of God on him. And he got up totally free. Hallelujah. Said that he'd been sitting there in his chair asking, Lord, let, please let one of them help me. Please let one of them help me. When God gave me a word of knowledge, praise God. I mean, fear will, fear will open the door. It, it'll, I mean, fear will kill you. Let's just say it that way. It'll kill your spiritual life, but it will kill you. It will kill you mind, soul, and body. Hallelujah. I mean, that's just the truth of it. Turn with me to Psalm 20, uh, 37, verse 8. Psalm 37, verse 8. I want everybody's eyes on it. This is my sign. Everybody's get your eyes on it. Get your eyes on it. Get your eyes on it. Everybody get your eyes on it. Is everybody there? Come on, turn till you get there. Look at your neighbor and help them get there. Make sure Psalms is in the middle of the Bible. Just open your Bible in the middle and go from there. Psalm 37, verse 8. I love these little simple, these little simple phrases. Because, you know, that's how God always gets me. Because, you know, I'm a girl. I like lots of words. I'm like, come on, God, tell me more, tell me more. Come on, God, tell me more. God just wants to say the little simple thing. And this is what he says. Is everybody there? Everybody that's there, raise your hand. Let me see your hands if you're there. Everybody's got your eye on it. You got your eye on it? All right. What's it say? It says, do not fret. It only causes harm. Do not worry. It only causes harm. Do not be anxious. It only causes harm. It only causes what? It only causes, oh, me giving God something where I'm stressing out about it. I'm worried about it. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to God and I'm praying about it and I'm praying about it. And it ain't doing nothing spiritually. It ain't doing nothing. Your fear and your worry and your anxiety, even in a spiritual form. And that's what's crazy about Christians is because they'll take something and try to make it spiritual. They'll take their fears and their worries about a, something and try to bring it into the prayer closet like, like, you know, they're praying about it and they got a burden about it. And the truth is their fear and worry makes God not be able to come anywhere near it. So it's not doing anything spiritual. It's only causing harm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
It only causes harm. Fear takes you captive. Remember, you get put into the snare. Fear is listed as a part of the curse given in Deuteronomy. Y'all remember that? Brother Emilio mentioned it this morning that in Deuteronomy 28, God gave the blessing. And he said, he said if, you'll, if you'll obey, then these blessings, oh, I like that, will run upon and overtake you. I love that about God. That, you know, he's always in the over and above, exceedingly above and beyond yeah. category. That's the measure of God. Yeah. We're, so, we're so messed up down here, concerned about waste. God isn't concerned about waste. There's more than enough. So those blessings are going to run up and overtake us. But then he has to go into the curses. Now, I know that the Bible says that we've been redeemed, but I want to show you about the curse here. Deuteronomy 28, verse 66 and 67 says, Your life shall hang in doubt before you. This is part of the curse. Your life shall hang in doubt or fear before you. You shall fear day and night. You ha shall have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, oh, that it were morning. Or I could just say like this. You could say, oh, if this situation was over. Oh, if God would just do this. Oh, if this situation was different. Oh, if my kid would just stop acting like a crazy person. Oh, my gosh, if I could just find a husband. Oh, my gosh, if God would just give me a better job. Oh, that's fear. Yes. All right. So that it were morning because of the fear which terrorizes your heart and because the sight with which your eyes see. We're not supposed to be looking at what we see in the natural. I want you to know that the natural is subject to change. All these temporary natural things, they're subject to change by the power of God. They're subject to change by God. Fear is equal to the curse. It's no wonder that God was so adamant about saying over and over and over again, don't do it, don't have it, don't take any part in it. It puts you in the curse category. And remember, God can't get you out himself. He's depending on you to make the right choice. Fear is the yoke of the devil. Yoke has a root meaning to join, to be joined together servitude, slavery, or burden imposed. A yoke is something which couples or binds together. Fear binds you to the devil. I mean, yokes you up. Puts his burden on you. But I want you to know that the anointing, yeah. the power of God breaks the yoke. Yeah. The power of God breaks the curse. The power of God is big enough to get rid of all the curse. Turn with me to Isaiah 10, 27. It was prophesied saying this about Jesus, that it shall come to pass in that day that his burden being the devil, the evil one, the one who's our afflictor, that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. Yeah. The curse, the yoke of fear has been destroyed by Jesus. It's been destroyed by the power of God. We've been redeemed from the curse. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus, the anointed one, the man upon whom power was rubbed, came and delivered us. Hallelujah. He delivered us. He delivered us from the curse. He delivered us from the, the, the fear. He took us. He took us and bought us back from the slavery and the captivity of fear. Hallelujah. Is that awesome or what? I want you to know it's just this simple. Jesus has set you free. And the Bible says that whom the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Today is your day. Today is your day. Glory to God. I know. I know last week at the end of service, we by the Spirit of the Lord had people stand up and acknowledge those that were dealing with fear, make a decision in their heart before the Lord, before the church family, that we were going to choose to come out of it. Amen. And I want you to know that today is your day. Amen. Hallelujah. Today is your day to be free.
And it's, it's not about me. It's about God. Amen. But the truth is, is that God is in heaven. And Jesus is seated at his right hand. And Jesus isn't coming off the throne to deliver you. He's already done his part. He's already done it at the, at the cross. He did all the work at the cross. He completed every single bit of it. He didn't leave anything undone. He died. And in his resurrection, he gained power. And that power is available. The Bible says one of Paul's prayers was that we would know the power that is toward us. I want you to know today that the power of God is toward you. The power of God is right here, right now, in this moment to deliver you. Why? Because God in heaven, Jesus in heaven, now sent his spirit to live in me, to live in you. We, the body of Christ, doing the works of Jesus, being his hands, being his feet, being his mouth. Today I can speak the word that Jesus would speak and bring deliverance to you. By the Spirit of God, by the power of God, because greater is He that's in me. Greater is He that's in you than any devil of fear, anything that's been harassing you. Greater is God. Come on, say, Greater is God. Greater is God. Greater is God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, you ought to be just getting ready. I mean, if you've got something, man, you're just like... And you know, the truth is, I don't even have to lay hands on you. I don't have to say anything to you. I mean, you can get it right where you're at. I mean, you know, the Bible says that the Word of God is like a hammer, Kevin. It's like a hammer. I mean, it just comes and breaks things right off. It just breaks things wide open. The Bible also says that the Word of God is like a fire, Jessica. It's like a fire. It comes in and it just burns out. The Word of God has been preached today. The Word of God that's alive and powerful, it's a living thing. The Word of God is a living thing. And it's come to your heart today to bring deliverance. And I want you to know on top of it, the Holy Ghost is here. The Bible said that the anointing breaks the yoke. And I tell you what, I'm fully convinced. There's not anybody in this room that can convince me otherwise that the anointing here today is not greater than whatever fear that you've been dealing with. So I want you to know deliverance is in the house today. The completed, finished work of the cross of Christ manifesting and showing up in every aspect of your life is in the house today. It's available. It's available. You just have to reach out and get it. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. If you're in Houston and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we are certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, salvation through Jesus Christ, or this ministry, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app.